So one area where we're really going to start to see the benefit of a tool like Ghidra is when we start to make our code more complex and add things like external calls to functions and things like STDIO or external libraries. So I want to show you sort of side by side the difference between just doing an OBJ dump and the difference between looking at Ghidra. I want to show you a bit about how these functions present inside of assembly code. So we have our very simple function, it just prints out hello world. You know, nothing really too complex here. So we'll just go ahead and compile that. And then I'm going to do my OBJ dump just to start things off, because I just want to show you generally what this looks like in just straight up assembly code. You'll see that it's pretty easy for us to find the printf function, right? It's right here. This is where the call actually happens. And then there's a bunch of stuff that happens before this, right? You can see an LEA, which is limiting an effective address. And it's loading based off this really interesting reference that references the instruction pointer. And it loads that address into RAX. We could assume that this is loading the actual hello world message. And then there's something else that happens here. For some reason, EAX gets cleared. And then we do the printf call. All of this seems a little odd. And if you don't know a lot of the details of like the actual like documentation for this function, you won't necessarily know exactly what's going on here. And to be completely honest, it's very hard to find the documentation for printf at an assembly level. So instead of doing that, what we could do is we could go to Ghidra and try to get a better picture of what's happening. So I'm going to simply put my binary in. Again, we could select all the format and language. We'll leave those all as defaults. And we'll do the analysis and leave everything as defaults and do that analyze. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here to functions and I'm going to go into my main function. You'll see here that we have all of the same sort of code, but there's some small differences. You can see here that with this load of effective address, what it's done is it's actually helped with the abstraction of the actual loading of data. So in the previous example, we saw that we were loading for, into RAX this particular reference here, which is some offset from the instruction pointer. In Ghidra, what it does is it tells you exactly what data is being loaded into RAX. So you get a very clear picture. And what you can actually do is you can actually double click on this, and it will take you to where that data is defined. So not only do you get the address of the data, you also get the actual data itself. And if you look a little bit higher up, you'll probably find more detail about, you know, what this data, like what section of the code this data is actually in and all of that good stuff, right? But generally, the most important part here is that you have the information about what this data actually is. So rather than having to dig through this assembly code, we have all the information in one place, which makes things way easier to work through. Now, in addition to this, we could sort of see when I click on printf, you see that that's the actual code for the printf. So it tells us that all of this is really just set up to make sure that printf is able to run successfully. Basically, what it's doing is it's preparing the parameters to be in the right registers for the actual printf. And then it's setting up any other parameters that are required and using those to actually load the printf function successfully. So that's generally what these are doing. These are preparing for the printf. Again, these were the lines of code that we had before that were setting up the main function. These were the returns from the main function. This right here is return code, which we see, right? So now we have a much clearer picture of the actual code itself. Now, I don't just want to give you just this context. I want to show you a few other interesting things that happen as we're working with these types of external functions and really just in general when we're working in C programming. And this is why it's really interesting to work from code that you actually know, because you'll start to see some really interesting things happen. Like, for instance, what if I do printf and I add a new line character at the end? I haven't changed anything. I just added a new line character. What do you figure might happen with this? Let's compile it. And you'll see, of course, the code still runs. Everything looks good. But when we put it into the decompiler, something very interesting is going to happen. I'm going to drag this in. I have to give this a different name because start is already taken. So we'll call it start2. And we'll, again, analyze it as we always do. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go into our main function. And I want you to notice that this function has changed. And you can see that here in the code as well. This is not a printf, it's a puts. Why did that happen? That's really bizarre, right? It actually changed the function. The reason why this happened is because when GCC actually compiled your code, what it did is it looked at this and it said, 
there is no format string, right? So we don't actually need to use printf for this. Since there's a new line character, we can actually use puts instead and it will be a little bit faster. And that's what it did. So it replaced that printf with puts. So you can see that the compiler is smart enough to actually optimize your code to make it a little bit better. And this in turn gives you the exact same output, but the way it gets to that output is different from what you might expect if you didn't look at this assembly code. You might've expected that it was a printf, but in reality it's puts. So you can see that that actually does change slightly, right? The actual function that's using is altered. So this is a very interesting thing to look at, right? So as you can see, we can't actually get this original code back, right? This original code doesn't actually exist because the compiler has changed it. And what we get out of the decompilation matches the compiler. So we get the optimized code rather than the original code. So do you see why it's generally a little bit tricky to figure out exactly what the original code was? Because the code actually does change when the compiler compiles it in some cases, right? It may do something to create better efficiency. And this is an example of that. And then what you'll see is, of course, when we take a look at these variables, everything sort of stayed the same. Because what happens is with puts, puts actually puts the new line character when it prints out the string. So we don't need to store the new line character in this variable, which again gives us a bit more efficiency in the actual you know, space that we're using for this as well. So that I just really wanted to show you the difference between things like, you know, if you were using printf versus put, as you can see, the compiler actually automatically optimizes it for you to pick the best option. Now, of course, if I change this again and I put in a format string, or if I remove the new line character, it will use printf. The reason why it doesn't use puts for this particular example is because there's no new line character. Puts adds a new line character, but printf in this case does not. So it has to keep printf, otherwise it would change the functionality of the program. And that's something that the compiler is not supposed to do. It's supposed to keep the functionality the exact same. So that's why this produces puts because the puts function is going to give us a new line. But if I don't have the new line, it uses printf. So that's just sort of an interesting thing that we see in the compiler. But if I were to specify a format string like this, every single time it's going to use the printf function because it has to. There's now a format string, so it has to actually use printf. And I could show you, again, if I compile this, you know, again, we run it, we see that the result is fine. There's no new line character. So this would generally also be using printf by default. Actually, maybe it makes sense for me to put the new line character in just to, just to prove that it's not gonna use puts. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's just try that again. And we have the new line character. And we're gonna go ahead and drag this in and just see what the code looks like here. And what you're going to see generally is that we are gonna have a printf. When I come over to uh, functions and I come over to main, you'll see that we do indeed have a printf. And you can see that it actually does pick up the new line character as well as the percent %d. So you can see that it does actually pick up all of that detail as well. So this just helps you understand more about why Ghidra is so useful for decompiling. You can see that these details would be really difficult to get out of an actual disassembly without this side panel that's giving us the C code equivalent to that code. So now using this idea, we're going to be able to really dive into looking at programs from a disassembly perspective. And that's what we're going to continue to do throughout the next few videos. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.